Hey, uh, we just got done checking your study guide, so if you haven't done that yet uh, in the class that you're in tomorrow, Purple Kids are listening to this on a video. Uh, if you haven't done that yet, let's get it done. Ten on your study guide due. Uh, and then we're going to talk today, our two main topics are some new technology that change warfare forever and actually push into sort of a modern era of warfare, something that we use today, especially naval warfare. No, Nathan, naval doesn't mean belly button. It means navy. Well, it actually means both things, but it'd be weird to have a war with your belly button. Not really sure how that would go. Probably be a big difference if you're an any or an Audi, right? I mean, I don't know. But anyway, navy. And then we'll talk about uh, the Battle of Shiloh, which is the bloodiest battle up to this point. It's a two-day battle, and it is nasty and ugly and bloody and, and, and bad. So we'll take a look at that. Then please don't forget if you've been assigned Medal of Honor Monday and you can look at the board if you're missing that. Uh, if you're not sure if that's you, look at the board and, and check it out. So Purple Kids, it's written on the board. P1, P2, P3, P5. Uh, take care of that business, please. And continue working on your study guide as we go. If there's something that pops up from today's class that is on your study guide, just go ahead and click it in. Otherwise, try to stay focused and try, try to stay where we are as we uh, get going today. Go back here. Switch to this. Not ready for Battle of Shiloh. Oh, yeah, we got some cool stuff before we even get to that. So I, I will back up to this because I'm not exactly sure where we left off. I think we talked about these amputations and we talked about these diseases. And the fact that an amputation that occurs farther away from your heart, you have a greater chance of surviving. So fingers and toes and, and uh, stuff like that compared to forearms and upper arms. And, and the closer you get to the core of your body, the bigger of a chance you have of death. And that probably has to do with the size of the limb that's being removed. You know, if you're you know, removing some limb at the middle thigh, there's a, a better than half a chance that you're going to die. Because your thigh is large, so there's more blood vessels that you'd have to tie off, and, and there's just more mass that has to be removed. So um, hip, you know, very few people survive uh, an amputation at the hip. And I think there were a couple of pictures yesterday that maybe showed that sort of amputation, but uh, pretty, pretty rough. But those are only federal amputations, so we have to at least double it because the Confederacy would have been doing the same thing. But the Confederacy kept really poor records throughout the war, and most of the records were either destroyed or lost when the war was over. They didn't want anybody knowing their stuff. But uh, all of those fatalities, fatality means killed um, as a result of amputation. So uh, the other day in class, we amputated somebody's arm, Olivia's arm, and she seems to be doing fine today. She's adjusted well to only having one arm or part of an arm. Stump. Is it a stump on the arm or is it just a stump with a leg? Stub? Instead of stump. Leg would be a stump and an arm would be a stump. That's probably about right. I'll take that. So, uh, Olivia's stub. Fine. So, glad to hear that. I was really hoping she wouldn't pass away as a result. So, I think we did that slide. And, and then we move on to this. This is also brand new technology embalming. Embalming means that uh, when somebody passes away, and, and by the way, talk about an advertisement for your business, right? You got two coffins standing up next to your embalming tent with dead guys in it. Embalming is a process that stops the decomposition of a body. So when someone dies, up to the Civil War, when someone dies, you want to bury them as quick as you can and get them in the ground because the body immediately upon death begins to decompose. It's going to swell up. It's going to fill with gases. It's going to get stinky almost instantly. So uh, it's a little bit different today because if somebody passes away, we typically don't hold a funeral for that person for three or four days at least because we'll wait for family to get together and we got to make arrangements and we got to hire the funeral home and we got to dig a grave. And so, but back then, they just dig a hole and stick you in it. Most people, that's still the case at the time of the Civil War, but because a lot of people that died were far, far away from home, 
if you're die if you die fighting in a battle located in the Confederacy and you're a Union soldier or a Confederate in Union territory, if you're wealthy enough, you could have your body embalmed and then sent home. Even in the heat of the summer, you could have your body embalmed and then sent home. The process is relatively gross. You see this guy here is being they're doing it on a table outside. But really what they do is they, they set you up on some sort of a table. Today it would be a nice stainless steel table. Uh, they cut slits in maybe your ankles where your arteries are. And they drain all the blood out of you. And as much bodily fluids as they can. And then they pump you full of preservatives. It's like making a human pickle. Pickles don't rot because there's so much, what, what is it, vinegar and stuff in pickles that they don't rot. You can eat a pickle that you can uh, two years ago, and it's still just fine for you. So a person that's embalmed, their body doesn't decay like a non-embalmed person. So you could take a week to get them home. Will they eventually decay? That question's too gross for me to really go into, but I've read stories that if you go to the cemetery and you dig up a body that was embalmed, Pretty much everybody that dies today is either cremated or embalmed. If you dig up that body, someone that died 10 years ago, and you open their coffin, this is creepy, they're going to look almost like they look the day they died. Which might be even creepier, those of you that watch zombie movies, because a zombie really isn't probably going to look any different than you and I. So it's possible that you're a zombie. We just don't know about it. I mean, look at Ty. He kind of looks like a zombie. It's just that he was embalmed really well. So uh, the first American president to be embalmed was Abraham Lincoln, which was necessary because he died in Washington, D.C. when he was shot at Ford's Theater. And then his body was returned to Springfield, Illinois. And it took nearly two weeks. So his body had to be in pretty good shape. And all the way, every time they stopped in a small town on the way back home to Illinois, they stopped the train so people could view the corpse of Abraham Lincoln. So he was pretty well preserved, I guess you would say. And that's what doctors do to bodies today, or what, not doctors, what uh, morticians do. Is they drain the fluids and they pump them full of pickle juice. Except it's not really pickle juice, it's really formaldehyde. But this is kind of interesting that, that now we have a tool to keep. That guy doesn't look dead, the guy standing there in the coffin. He looks just like everyone else because he's well preserved. So it's a new science. If you decide you want to go that direction with your life, morticians make a lot of money. And the beautiful thing about being a mortician is they're never going to run out of business. People are always dying. So, but you got to know a lot about science and you got to be able to deal with grossness. Not sure I can do it. But these are embalming tools, so you can see this thing would be filled with uh, the embalming juice, the formaldehyde, and, and then it could just be pumped into the body, seal up all the exits, the, the, the holes where you cut and slits to drain the fluids and, and pump them full. Uh, so in the Civil War, gastric enema pump. <laughs> no, thank you for not going that direction. So uh, that's kind of interesting stuff, but... Anyway, here's a guy getting embalmed, and, and the, the, the embalmer just stuck the tool right in his heart. Well, that works pretty good, because the heart is the delivery system to all of the rest of the body. So just jabbed it into his chest, right into his heart. This dead man here is being preserved so that his family can get him later. And it's quite a business. I mean, today, when you think of a funeral parlor or a mortuary, place where you go to visit that's not the church. Usually they're pretty fancy, but this is like an old barn. You might be doing embalming next to the sheep or the cattle, but embalming the dead, Dr. Fennell, free from odor or infection. New science. All right, so let's go into this new technology that I'm going to talk about. Uh, the first one is called uh, the Merrimack. Here's the deal. When the Union left Confederate territories, just like when they were forced out of uh, Fort Sumter, when they left, they couldn't always take everything with them. But 
They didn't want to leave any military tools for the Confederacy, so they either took it with them or they did their best to try to destroy it. This is an example of something they couldn't take with them, so they tried to destroy it. The USS Merrimack was a ship. Anything that says USS is a warship. The USS Merrimack was a warship that they tried to scuttle so before the Union was forced out of the port at Hampton Roads in Virginia, they sunk the Merrimack. The Confederacy had literally no navy, so when they come into the port, they're like, gosh, what are we going to do? We could sure use some ships, because if you remember, part of the Union's strategy to defeat the Confederacy was that anaconda, and that anaconda meant that they're going to put ships all the way along the southern coast to blockade anything from getting in and anything getting out. If the Confederacy had some ships of their own, they might be able to stop the blockade. So they're looking around and they're like, God, they didn't leave us any ships. And then they see that there's one sunken over there. I don't know. I've never taken the time to look this up, but I don't know what the technology was that allowed them to surface the Merrimack. But they brought it to the surface. They took it into what's called dry dock. Dry dock just means you float a boat into a special dock, you close a gate behind it, and then you pump all the water out. Now they can repair the Merrimack, so then they'll have a navy. They rename her the CSS Virginia, and they do something special with her that had never been tried before. They cover her with iron plating. So they take a sailed warship, the USS Merrimack, cover it with steel or iron plates, and add a steam engine. This is brand new high-tech stuff. And then they add cannon to it. So this old, old, old USS Merrimack that was probably crummy in the first place, that's why they left it there is now a top-of-the-line new warship. The problem is, this idea was so brand new, nobody really knew if it was going to work. You have a really heavy boat now, a wooden boat that's covered in iron plates. So they were a little nervous. When they get done building this thing, it looks something like this. So picture a regular warship with great big tall masts and sails. Now this. So what you see here, uh, these things sticking off the side, those are just holding it upright in dry dock. So this is the dry dock. They just pull the thing in, close the gates behind it, pump the water out. So this is the sea back here. And then once they're done, all they got to do to float this ship is open up slowly the valves on the dry dock, and the thing will fill up with water, and the float should become, or the boat should become buoyant. It should float. This is what she looks like. I believe the... Uh, CSS Virginia had 14 cannon. I'm going to double check this. She's got quite a few. Well, we're going to go with 14 because I don't see it on my notes anywhere. I was fairly certain I had it. Anyway, this thing, a lot of people are like, oh my gosh, you're wasting resources and money because the Confederacy really doesn't have a lot of extra iron and they certainly don't have any extra money, but they're looking for something that's better than a wooden warship, so they have a chance to break that blockade. People think this is not even going to float. It's just going to stay stuck to the bottom of the mud in dry dock. But when they fill the dry dock, all of a sudden it breaks free <coughs> from its suction to the bottom of the dry dock, and it just barely floats. The CSS Virginia floats just above the water line. So barely any of the deck is exposed on this thing. So it's got all those portholes are for cannon. The stack coming out of the top is for the steam and for the smoke to come out of. And you might have noticed they added a feature to the front of the boat. This pointy thing on the front is called a spar. Just this spar alone weighs 1,500 pounds. Anybody want to guess what its purpose was? You ram into a ship with this thing, it pokes a gigantic hole in it. Uh, if you take a, a, a sharp metal object that weighs 1,500 pounds and run it into a wooden object that is the Union's warships, which one wins, the steel or the wood? Steel. Steel wins. Then 
you have a hole in that wooden ship that's just below the water line because this is underwater. So now, instead of just using cannons, you can use this thing like a demo derby car, for crying out loud. It's going to be very effective and efficient if it works the way they think it's going to work. So they take it out for a test drive, but barely. On the second day that the CSS Virginia is afloat, that they take her out. Uh, in the test, they find out that she can go between five and six knots, nautical miles per hour. That's how you measure speed at sea, uh, which is approximately six miles per hour. Her top speed is six miles per hour. All ships are hers, by the way. That's why her pronoun is her. Uh, I don't know why. It's just the way it is. Even <laughs> ships that are named with male names, like the USS George Bush is an aircraft carrier, uh, it is a her. It's got a boy name, but it's a girl. I don't know why. It's just naval uh, tradition, I suppose. Uh, a modern uh, ship, a modern warship can travel at approximately 40 knots. So seven, what, eight, eight times faster, almost. The USS George Bush, which is one of the largest ships in the American fleet, it is a ginormous aircraft carrier, can travel at just over 30 knots. So even gigantic warships can move really fast compared to this. Now, aircraft carriers can outrun a lot of enemy warships. So the question is always, could an enemy warship defeat an American aircraft carrier? And the answer is difficult to say because they're so large, one, uh, one missile is not going to do it. It's going to take multiple. And by the time uh, any enemy is able to attack an, a modern American aircraft carrier, there's a, at least usually almost always one U.S. submarine nearby. The enemy doesn't know where it's at, so that submarine's probably going to sink it before it's even able to fire its first missile. And uh, aircraft carriers don't travel alone. They travel with a whole fleet of ships. So our carriers are pretty safe, and they're really freaking fast. So if they're under attack, whoosh, they get the heck out. So they float this thing. They take her out. On her very first day at sea, she's led by a Captain uh, Buchanan. He's the captain of the, the CSS Virginia. They leave Norfolk, Virginia shipyard. On March 8, 1862, they head for a, uh, an American warship in the blockade in the Anaconda called the USS Cumberland. So she's off in the distance. And the Cumberland sees this thing coming, and they're like, what the heck is that? They've never seen anything like this. This thing is belching smoke, and it's bobbing along like a, a fishing bobber in the water, and it looks like it could sink at any moment. And all of a sudden, it attacks with its 1,500-pound ram. It just runs right into the Cumberland. The Cumberland doesn't even know that it should be in retreat or that it should be maneuvering. It just gets rammed right into, and within a matter of minutes, the Cumberland goes down. The problem is, this is the very first attack, and the Captain Buchanan is like, Ooh, this is great, because it's working. The Virginia is able to defeat a, a, a powerful American warship without any damage. The American warship's firing on this thing, and cannonballs bounce right off because it's made of metal. The problem, that 1,500-pound metal pointy thing sticking off the front, gets stuck in the side of the Cumberland. So now the CSS Virginia is starting to go down with it. Very luckily for Captain Buchanan and the Confederates, that spar, that 1,500-pound spear on the front, breaks off. The Cumberland goes down. Captain Buchanan and his men are like, Woo, we've done it! The war will be over in no time! It's working. Very quickly, they turned their sights on a separate, a second target, the USS Congress. The USS Congress just watched what happened to the USS Cumberland, and they were like, OMG, this is no good. We better get the heck out of here. So the USS Congress uh, set sail toward the shore, thinking that if it goes into the shallows, maybe the, the, he the weight of the CSS Virginia will keep it from advancing. The Congress accidentally maybe on purpose, uh, strands itself on a sandbar. So now it can't move. Now the CSS Virginia, which is missing one of its main weapons that spar, sits off at a distance and opens fire with cannonballs. The captain of the Congress decides it might be a good idea to surrender, maybe thinking that by nightfall, 
the tide would come in and the Congress could float away. But he comes out, raises a white flag and surrenders. And Captain Buchanan, as ecstatic as he is that he's just won this great victory over two powerful American warships, he comes out onto the deck of the CSS Virginia to accept the surrender of the Congress, and somebody on shore shoots him in the face. Doesn't kill him, but Captain Buchanan's like, don't, oh, gosh, darn it. So instead, uh, he gets back in his ship. He orders his men to send hot shot at the Congress, which probably is silly because his goal ultimately should have been to capture the Congress because the South needs more warships. But instead, they use hot shot, which just means they take cannonballs that are heated to the point where they're smoldering red. They fire them at the Congress, and as soon as those cannonballs hit, instead of just splintering the wood, they create fires. And a fire on a wooden warship is really scary. So the Congress burns up. Buchanan and the CSS Virginia retreat. It's time to go home for the night. So they head back into Hampton Roads. Pretty crazy. Once they get back, uh, Buchanan needs some, some help. Uh, on the night of May 8th, so the very next day in 1862, the Union comes out with something special of their own. It's weird how at almost exactly the same time these two sites came out with brand new technology that neither side necessarily knew about. The Union comes close to Hampton Roads with a boat called the USS Monitor. It is also ironclad. So on the very next morning, the CSS Virginia has no idea that the Union has their own metal boat nearby. So they send the CSS Virginia out with a new captain. This time the captain's name is Catsby Jones. I like the name Catsby. Uh, he takes off and automatically, immediately sees another American warship in the blockade, the USS uh, Montana, or Minnesota. Montana didn't exist yet. The USS Minnesota. He sets his sights and bears down toward the Minnesota, and as Catsby Jones gets closer to the Minnesota, he sees something right in between it and the Minnesota. He doesn't recognize it. He's not sure what it is. He calls it what appears to be a tin can on a shingle. The design of the monitor is completely different. Whereas the Confederates took a warship and made it into a metal ship, the Union just built a metal ship, the very first completely metal ship. This has a wooden frame. The USS Monitor doesn't, and it looks completely different. Whereas this one has, I believe, 14 cannon, big cannon. The USS Monitor looks like this. It folds about six inches above the water line, and it has one or two cannon. Any idea how the heck this thing is supposed to be? Smaller, but how is this thing supposed to be effective? It's only got one or two cannon. Good, good answer, but no, the monitor actually does not have a spar. It doesn't have a, a spear attached to it. And the Virginia's is gone still. They didn't replace it overnight. That's a good answer, though. This uh, thing on top, the tin can, is brand new technology. Anybody want to guess what it does that makes it special? Nope, good answer, though. The tin can on top of the monitor was a rotating turret. What does that mean? It can go 360 degrees. Where do we typically think of rotating turrets existing? On, on what war machine do we typically see turrets? Tank. On tanks, right? This is like the top of a tank. The cannon is built into that thing. So the monitor has an advantage over other warships because when the Virginia wants to fire on its enemy, most of its cannon are on the side. So what's the Virginia have to do before it can open fire? Very slowly and lumberingly, it has to turn its side towards its enemy, and then it can open fire. When the monitor wants to fire on its enemy, all it has to do is rotate the turret. This is slick new technology. This could be game-changing. Now we have two ironclad warships. Now both of them 
are hulkingly slow. The Monitor travels just barely faster than the Merrimack or the Virginia um, at about six knots. So they're really very similar. Uh, the turning radius of the CSS Virginia, so if it wants to turn in a circle, one mile turning radius, and if it wants to turn, so like if it sails past the monitor and it has to turn around and head back toward its enemy, it takes a mile for it to turn and 45 minutes. So battles between these two lumbering oaks are going to be long and slow. They're going to take a lot of time because most of their time is going to be maneuvering. Oh, it does here. 14 9-inch cannons. So the cannonballs it shoots are 9 inches. On March 9th, uh, Catsby Jones is in charge, steams out towards the Minnesota. Uh, for several hours, the Monitor is, uh, and, and the Virginia are uh, battling. After several hours, the Monitor, this one here, seems to be taking on some water. Uh, and uh, the captain of the Monitor and the Virginia is also taking on water. So both of them have done some damage to each other. Neither have done enough damage that they're actually going to sink. But the captain of the monitor uh, takes a, a gunshot, right? He's inside this, this little box right here on the front. A cannonball explodes right near his box, and it sends pieces of shrapnel into his eyes. So the captain of the monitor says, whoa, whoa, fall back, just so he can clean out his eyes. He's like, no, this hurts. So he wants to clean the gunk out of his eye and orders the ship to fall back to a safe distance. When it falls back, Catsby Jones on the Virginia assumes that the monitor has gone into retreat and his ship is taking on water slowly. So he orders the CSS Virginia to head back to port. He assumes that he's won. The captain of the monitor when he gets his eyes cleaned out, he goes, okay, let's go get him, men. And they turn around and they head back into what they think is the battle. The Virginia is gone, so the captain of the monitor assumes that he has won. So the first battle between two ironclad warships is a tie. Neither side was able to gain a victory out of this thing. So uh, they both head back. Uh, both ships last almost a year before they're sunk. But what do you think this does to every Navy in the world from this day on? What do you think the British, who is the most powerful Navy on the planet at the time, what do you think the British think when they hear stories of these two American metal warships? Is a wooden ship ever going to be any good again? Yeah. Not after this point. And one thing we know is the first time uh, we're usually not very good at things, but we improve upon the design. Every time we build one of these new ships, it gets better and better and better. So every Navy in the world is now going, oh my gosh, we've got to change. Because wooden warships are never going to be any good again. This is a, a photograph on top of the deck of the monitor. So these are some of the sailors. By the way, they said that the biggest difficulty on both of these ships for the sailors was the deafening noise of the steam engines. And if you can imagine, if you're inside one of these things when it takes a direct hit from a cannonball, uh, the noise that must happen when a cannonball strikes metal plating, sort of like being in a, a, a metal shop when it's raining, it's really loud because that metal roof is like... So imagine getting hit by a cannonball inside a, a, a metal like this. And they said in the summertime, it was so smokingly hot that you couldn't breathe. You're just sweltering and hot. There's no air conditioning. There's no ventilation. So these guys were tough dudes to sail on these ships. So this is an image of what it might have looked like as the Monitor and the Virginia are battling. And you can see why they call it a tin can on the ship. It's just barely floating above the surface of the water. And... Uh, even when they hit direct hits, they don't do all that much damage. So, um, interesting. Wooden ships are toast, but metal ship versus metal ship is going to take some new tactics. More images here. Even uh, on the top right picture, you see next to the, the porthole or whatever that is, two big dents. You've got to assume those are dents that were made from Confederate cannonballs. Here we see the CSS Virginia, and look, she's not even completely floating. So this technology is brand new baby technology. It's sort of like when a car company comes out with a new design, 
everybody's always excited because it's a fun new design, but that first version is usually junk. So, you know, when Tesla comes out with a brand new Tesla pickup truck, yeah, it'd be fun to be the first owner of the Tesla. By the way, I think they're awful and ugly. Tannen thinks they're the coolest truck ever. You want to be the first one to own one, but yet it's going to be a piece of junk. You better wait until the second or third model come out and they fix all the mistakes that they made in the first one that they don't know about until someone drives it for 100,000 miles. Other versions of ironclads, some USS means they're American and CSS means they're Confederate. By the way, casualties in that battle. Uh, this is kind of an interesting statistic. Because on those two days of fighting, first day, the Union really didn't have anything that it could do. Uh, 369 Union casualties, only 24 Confederates. So by destroying the Congress and the Cumberland, <coughs> the Confederacy did some massive damage to the Union troops. Uh, even among the Confederates, only seven of those casualties are killed, 17 are wounded. Actually, that Battle of Hampton Roads that I just talked about was the bloodiest day in naval history all the way up until Pearl Harbor. So in American naval history, there had never been a nastier day than the Battle of Hampton Roads because nearly, nearly 400 men are killed or wounded. Pearl Harbor makes that look like a pillow fight, but that's a story for another day when you're studying World War II. Bloody, bloody day. Okay, let's talk about another battle, a land battle this time. No real new technology, some new tactics. This is General McClellan. He's taken over when Irvin McDowell was too much of a hesitator. McClellan himself is going to be a bit of a hesitator, too. But he's in command of the Eastern Front. So McClellan takes over the Army of the Potomac, which is the best of the Northern armies. He's kind of the boss right below Ulysses Grant. His men are well-trained and well-organized. He's actually a fairly good coach when it comes to getting his men prepared. I would say that uh, sometimes there's coaches that are good at getting people ready for battle, and sometimes there's coaches that aren't very good at battle. And then sometimes you got coaches that aren't very good at pre preparation, but they're really good at game time. I don't know, maybe that was the case with uh, Coach Frost. From everything we're hearing from the players, he wasn't very good at preparing them to be ready to play the game, but then in game time, he wasn't a bad coach. They had pretty good tactics usually to keep it close. His guys just weren't ready. I think that's probably the case with uh, George McClellan here. He's a good guy at getting his men ready, but he's always hesitant to use them, reluctant to attack. And then we see General Grant in the South. General Grant's kind of an interesting character because when the war breaks out, Grant isn't even in the Army. He'd been forced out of the Army. He'd been forced to retire. Grant fought in the Mexican War. Grant's been around. He's got a lot of experience. But throughout his entire career, he made enemies. Now, everyone has enemies, at least somewhere at some point. Reagan, wake up. Pay attention. Just pay attention. Okay, then go to the stand-up desk. Okay, in Fort Calhoun, you're going to have to stay awake, too. But you do it every day, and it's old. No, you do. It's disrespectful. I don't appreciate it. Don't wave your hands and say, okay, just take it, because you're doing bad things. Just take it. I'll see you after class. So... Grant wasn't even in the Army. He'd been kind of run out. He was sort of told, you either need to retire and go home, or we're going to kick you out. Because his enemies were pointing out that uh, Grant had a bad habit of being drunk and derelict of duty. People that didn't like him said going into battle, Grant was drinking. 
in the military, you're not supposed to consume alcohol when you're on duty or getting ready to go on duty because obviously you're going to put other people in jeopardy. So Grant retired. He went home. Uh, his wife and children were happy to see him, and Grant tries everything. He tries to be a tanner, just like John Brown had tried to. He fails at it. Uh, he, was, he, he pretty much did the same things John Brown did, but he wasn't good at anything. And then the war breaks out, and Abraham Lincoln, we know that the North has issues when it comes to finding leadership. We know that the South had better leaders. So Abraham Lincoln's like, who do we got out there? And, and his secretary of war is going through the names of all the guys, and he's like, well, we got this guy, General Grant. He retired a little while ago. He was pretty good, but... And Abraham Lincoln goes, I don't want to hear the butts. Go get him. So they go to his house in Illinois, and the War Department knocks on his door, and General Grant, he, this is how I picture this. General Grant peers through the, the curtains and he sees it's the War Department and he tells his wife, tell him I'm not here. And she's like, well, just talk to him. And, and he goes, no, I'm not here. So he goes and hides in the bedroom or something. She opens the door and they're like, can we please speak to General Grant? And she goes, well, he's not here right now. What do you fellas need? Well, we need to talk to him because uh, there's war brewing and we really need his leadership and his skills. Um, Mrs. Grant had seen how miserable her husband was because he was horrible at everything. And I don't think, I think this is true. Most wives don't like seeing their husbands being miserable. Most husbands don't want to see their wives miserable either. Except for Mrs. Bellamy, I think she thrives on the fact that I'm miserable. She likes to see me suffer. Maybe I'm wrong, but I think that's it. Some of you are like, yeah, I think my mom's that way too. Anyway, Mrs. Grant must have been nice because even though no woman probably ever wants to send her husband off to war, Mrs. Grant understood that that was the only thing he was good at. And it's the only thing he really liked. So she's like, yeah, he's not here. He's in the back room. So he comes out like, oh, gosh, why do you have to tell him? And they're like, Mr. Grant, we need you. And he's like, you guys told me to go home. And he's like, we need you. We need leadership. So they don't put Grant in a position where he's going to be noticed. They send him out west. They don't give him the job where, where you're going to be seen every day. They send him out west to do the dirty work where nobody's paying any attention. So immediately Grant takes over in the west, and he immediately builds a reputation of being a hard-nosed fighter. By the way, for those of you that aren't very big, I always think this is kind of a funny statistic. General Grant was uh, an expert horseman. I'll, I'll go through a couple of things. Um, he was an artist, and he loved to read books. So not all warriors are like, they're our tough guys. He finished in, in his class at West Point, so he did go to the military academy, finished 21st out of 39 cadets. So right in the middle. We talked about this before. Even if you finish 39th out of 39, <coughs> You're still among the best of the best. So he's right in the middle of his class. He's going to be among the best. But Grant's issues weren't so much that he wasn't good at the studies of warfare. It was that he was kind of a slob. So his uniform was always untucked or dirty. Uh, he didn't have his beard shaven. He just had issues. So he's always receiving demerits. That's why he graduated so low. In fact, he got a little lucky to get into West Point. Because when he shows up, uh, he's excited and, and he got in and he stands at the registrar's desk and he says, um, Ulysses Simpson Grant reporting for duty. They looked at him and they said, uh, we don't have anybody by that name here. And they looked it up in the book and he's like, oh. actually, uh, his name wasn't Ulysses Simpson Grant. It was something else. And I don't remember what it was, which is ridiculous because I should know that. And the guy goes, wait a minute. We do have a Ulysses. Uh, no, his, his real name. Thank you. I'm going to back up a little bit. His real name was Hiram. Ulysses was his middle name. So he steps up to the registrar and he says, Hiram Ulysses Grant reporting for duty. And the registrar says, we don't have a Hiram Grant. On our, on our 39 students, you're not here. And he goes, wait a minute, we do have a Ulysses Simpson grant. Ulysses was his middle name. Simpson was his mother's maiden name. Someone screwed up the paperwork. He goes, yep, that's me. He wasn't stealing somebody's spot. It's just that they screwed up the paperwork, and he liked it. He hated the fact that his name was Hiram. 
It's what his real name was, Hiram. The mama, he was born like, oh, little baby Hiram. He hated it. Because he wasn't very big. Here's the part where I say, if you're not a very big guy, it don't mean you can't be a tough guy. Here, uh, Ulysses Grant, at the time he was 17 years old, was five foot two and weighed 117 pounds. He's pretty small. Kind of a little giant, you might say. Because of his size and because of his name, Hiram Ulysses Grant, his friends gave him the nickname Huggy. If you picture yourself as a tough guy and you want to be a warrior, you really want the nickname Huggy? No. So you go to the military academy and they give you the name Ulysses Simpson Grant, U.S. Grant. If you want to be an American war hero, how about the initials U.S.? United States Grant. So he takes it and he goes into the academy and he has some success. But initially, uh, he has some success fighting in the West. At Fort Henry and Fort Donaldson, he wins. He allows boats to reach as far as uh, Alabama. Uh, so he's kind of kicking tail. And then the Battle of Shiloh yeah. breaks out. The Battle of Shiloh takes place at a church in Tennessee, April 6, 1862. This is going to be the fiercest fighting of the war up to this time. 40,000 Confederate troops mass under Albert Sidney Johnston, and they attack Ulysses Grant and his men. Uh, Grant is getting his rear end whooped. In fact, in the very beginning hours of this battle, Grant is nowhere to be found. Grant claims he was out on a ride doing reconnaissance when the battle started. Grant's enemies that fought under him said Grant was drunk at derelict of duty. He was sleeping off a hangover. Are they right? I don't know. We'll come back to that in just a minute. By the way, Albert Sidney Johnston, the leader of the Confederate troops, will be the highest ranking officer on either side to die in battle. He gets killed at the Battle of Shiloh. Oh, this is a tough guy, too. Albert Sidney Johnston gets shot in the leg, and he's, he's injured, but he refuses to go to the field hospital, even though his men are like, you're wounded, sir, you've got to go, until all of a sudden the dude falls off of his horse, dead or a hammer. What had happened was Albert Sidney Johnson took a bullet in the leg, and he had on tall riding boots, like up to his knees. When they pulled off his boot to determine how bad the wound was, his boot was full of blood. So the dude bled to death. He's that tough of a guy. So the Confederates attack the Union. The Union's kind of on its heels. After the first day, there are 30,000 Confederates and 40,000 Union troops, uh, and it looks like the Confederates might be able to rout them. Total men involved are 45,000 Confederates and 62,000 Union troops once reinforcements show up. By the second day, there are 23,000 casualties in one day of fighting, 23,000 men killed or wounded. This dwarfs anything we see from the entire American Revolution in one day of fighting. The Battle of Shiloh is nasty and ugly. By the time Grant shows up, uh, his men are like, after the first day, they're like, Sir, we've got to retreat. And Grant says, famously, he says, retreat? No, I propose to attack at daylight and whip them. Grant is not a quitter. He's not turning around. And what Grant knows that some of his men and some of his other officers don't know is he's got reinforcements coming under the command of a guy named Don Carlos Buell. And when Buell shows up with 30,000 more Union troops, he knows that he's got more men than the Confederates do, and he can turn the tide of war against them. On day two, when those reinforcements show up, uh, they're outnumbered. Uh, they outnumber P.T. Beauregard, who takes over for Albert Sidney Johnson. So here's Beauregard again, uh, by 30,000 men. Even if you're not as good, if you've got 30,000 more men, you're probably going to win. Uh, one southern soldier at a part of the battlefield called the Sunken Road, or the Hornet's Nest, described it as zipping bullets sound like angry hornets. It's a hornet's nest in here. So there were so many bullets flying through the air that you could feel them whizzing past your head like an angry hornet. So it's almost impossible to paint an image of being at one of these battles, but it gives you a pretty good idea. Uh, after the Battle of Shiloh, which is a Lincoln victory, uh, some of Grant's, or, which is a Union victory, some of Grant's men go to Abraham Lincoln and they're like, you got to get rid of this guy. He was drunk. He smells funny. He doesn't clean up very well. And... and Lincoln says, I cannot spare this man. He fights. 
So even if he does have weaknesses like alcoholism, which still is a question mark in history because Grant's going to go on to be a hero, and any time we see heroes, we're usually willing to overlook their weaknesses. Like Captain America had really smelly feet. Nobody ever mentions that because he was Captain America. Our Superman didn't brush his teeth. Nobody cares because he's Superman. I'm just kidding, Ethan. Superman brushed his teeth. So don't stop brushing your teeth just because you're a superhero. That'd be weird. I'm just kidding, Ethan. Anyway, so Grant now has established himself as the man, and the Battle of Shiloh is nasty. Images and sketches of this thing, uh, and we start to see photography after battles take place. This is immediately following Shiloh. The problem is, I'll talk about this briefly, and then we're going to be done for today. The problem with photography is the photographers weren't always there. The number one Civil War photographer was a, a Union gentleman named Matthew Brady. And photography, even though it's good, it took uh, wagon loads of equipment. In fact, the pictures that you see, this isn't on a piece of film like what we would see a, a photograph on today. It's actually on a glass plate. So to make a photograph, photographers had to paint a glass plate with special chemicals. <coughs> Stored in a, in a dark box, and then when they pull the glass plate out and stick it in the camera, uh, they open the lens of the camera for a certain amount of time, exposing light and darkness to that glass plate, and that's what we see in these images. So if you can imagine wagon loads full of glass plates and caustic chemicals that'll eat the skin off of your hands, bouncing along where there aren't any roads through rough terrain, it was really difficult to get there. So sometimes photographers would show up at places like Shiloh or even Gettysburg days after. And by that time, they've already cleaned up the bodies. They, they basically dig a trench, and whoever the winner is is responsible for cleaning up the battlefield, and they drag the corpses into this trench and cover them just deep enough that animals don't dig them up. So by the time Matthew Brady gets to Shiloh, it could be, and I don't know this for sure, that the battle was over and the battlefield was cleaned up. And he's like, Gah! So in that case, he just grabs some guys and he says, come lay over here like this and maybe even use some cow's blood to make them appear bloody. And he just poses them as if they're dead. So when we look at this picture, there really isn't any way for us to know if that's a real picture of casualties of war or if those are men who were told, lay there and don't move. It's sort of the 1862 version of Photoshop. It existed. Can change it once it's created, but some of the photos aren't real. But nobody knows that, so they could get away with it. We'll start with the rest of photo history on uh, blah, 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 Friday, next time we're together. Um, make sure, if you're missing that uh, map worksheet, that you get that done and get that to me as soon as possible, please.